So thanks so much uh, to Tracy for the invitation to present here. Um, thanks to everybody for attending. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a wonderful series uh, of, of webinars, like really um, instructive. Um, and so we're really glad to be invited to contribute. Um, Nikki and I are from the Open and Reproducible Research Group in Graz, uh, as Tracy says. Um, and today we'll talk about a paper um, which we wrote in the context of uh, 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 Horizon 2020 European funded project um, called On Merit. Uh, the paper is entitled Towards Ep Equitable Open Research, Stakeholder Co-Created Recommendations for Research Institutions, Funders and Researchers. So it's in uh, Royal Society Open Science, and I think you'll have the link. Uh, but just to mention as well that um, this we also kind of have a, a policy output, which is uh, more, so the paper is more about the methods and kind of an overview of the process. So uh, most instructive for today's, but just to refer you also to the brief, the, the policy document, which was the main output um, in terms of impact on, on affecting policy. Um, so uh, just to give a bit of background on, why we chose these methods, these particular methods, and the particular issues that we were looking at. Um, I'll just say something very briefly about the On Merit project itself. I'll talk very, um, uh, give some background about using Delphi and co-creation, and then Nikki will take over and lead us through the exact uh, steps which we followed um, in our co-created, co-created modified Delphi uh, process. So the On Merit project was, um, a project from 2019 to 2022. Um, and the key research question there was whether open science uh, might actually be at risk in some cases of reinforcing existing privileges or creating new ones. So equity is very, a very commonly stated aim of open science, but we were noticing um, with some issues that it might actually be in danger of threatening um, uh, equity rather than helping. So uh, we used a broad uh, array of uh, research methods, sociological, bibliometric, computational. And the aim was to look at these issues of equity and open science, uh, including interfaces with industry and policy, and then to finally ensure that open science and, and uh, re responsible research and innovation uh, interventions actually contribute to a more equitable scientific system um, we looked at a broad array of, of contexts in our res primary research activities, but the most important for us today is that um, through an analysis of all these research findings, synthesis, and then production of recommendations, we hope to actually have impact on policy um, at the end of the day, change policies to um, help make open science more, uh, the way that open science is implemented more equitable in its outcomes. Uh, and so uh, we looked at these different areas, so effects of barriers to accessing literature, um, uh, uptake of open science resources in industry and, and what the drivers and barriers were there. Um, uh, analyzing patent literature, we also looked at um, uptake of open science resources within policymaking itself. And this was the first uh, kind of two phases of the project. And then the final say, phase was this synthesis and recommendations which is the output that we'll discuss uh, today. Um, just a little more back background about the issues, because we will talk, as well as talking about the methods that we used, I think the methods that we used were also kind of um, informed by, by our own ethos, um, our own kind of commitments to responsible research and innovation and open science. So, uh, also published in the Royal Society of Open Science is this uh, scoping review where we looked at um, uh, dynamics of cumulative advantage and threats to equity. So how um, open science might in, in some uh, cases actually help the rich get richer. That is that the, those uh, particularly in global North countries, those in uh, more well-resourced institutions have more resources at hand to put open science practices and responsible research and innovation practices um, uh, in, uh, in, into practice. Um, and that this may mean uh, that there are kind of chain, uh, uh, 
differences in outcomes for those with different levels of, of resources um, or, or different demographics. Uh, and so we identified lots of uh, uh, kind of issues such as um, the costs of participation in open science, you know, running uh, data repositories or even creating training events such, uh, such as these, for example, uh, these all take resources and those resources are very often within certain institutions, within certain regions. We were particularly interested to look at the way that the, uh, the model of open access where the author pays uh, the, an article processing charge, whether this affects um, uh, who publishes where and what the implications of that could be for um, uh, research assessment and um, for yeah, uh, acknowledgement of, of people's research contributions. We, in the scoping review, we also looked at um, the way that uh, just opening data maybe uh, isn't enough if the competences and the infrastructures aren't in place for everybody in the world to actually exploit that data and that maybe um, those uh, competences or um, um, uh, infrastructures again, are centered with, with certain types of actors who are already the, the more privileged. Um, the way that open science relies on uh, platforms and this kind of funnels usership and especially to proprietary platforms, lack of reward structures, and the way that in responsible research and innovation, and especially open science, that maybe we haven't uh, properly looked at the, the role of collaboration and participation with the broader range of uh, society, that it's uh, maybe still uh, quite insular. And so one final example, here's a paper which was an outcome from um, On Merit, where we looked at um, APCs and the stratification of open access publishing. So does the fact that um, you need to pay to publish open access in certain journals mean that there are differences in who publishes where? Um, and especially because a, uh, the article processing charges, very often they're higher for those journals which are considered more prestigious. The nature journals, for example, commonly charge 10,000 euros or so. Um, so do research, so we found that indeed researchers from better resource institutions published more APC based away, pay higher APCs, that the influence of institutional resources on these levels of APCs is stronger uh, in lower income countries. And the headline is that open access publishing involving article processing charges is creating a new barrier for who can publish where. And this is, um, a policy problem. The, the, the policies on how to implement open access, you know, there are different ways of implementing open access. Um, we can publish in subscription journals and still share our manuscripts in um, institutional repositories, for example, or we can create journals where we arrange the funding in such a way that there are no fees for the authors or fees for the readers. And so um, here the the kind of key recognition is that there's been far too much emphasis on, um, uh, on this APC-based open access, um, which has played to the, uh, the kind of, uh, uh, the interests of the publishers, especially, and maybe not to the interests of, uh, of equity within the research community. And so if this is a policy problem, then policy recommendations for this issue, this issue would be um, desirable. So that's where we come to the end of that, uh, the end phase of that project and the, the process of creating with uh, stakeholders recommendations for how to address these issues, how to make these kinds of issues better in the future. Um, and so for that, uh, this is, uh, it, it was a 30 month project and here we this uh, process took place in like the last six and especially the last four months of the project. So we um, decided to go with the Delphi um, uh, uh, method, but given our emphasis as a project on open science, on um, responsible research and innovation, we wanted to fuse that with more collaborative 
um, uh, means of uh, co-creation of um, enabling deliberative dialogue between stakeholders. So to work through these issues with stakeholders in the process of um, uh, coming up with these recommendations. There's kind of a core tension in that because um, one of the key aspects of Delphi, if you attended the um, a webinar, which Tracy mentioned um, in this series in July by Kelly Kobe. So one of the key um, ideas of, uh, of the Delphi method is anonymity of the stakeholders. So, and um, here, this is especially to kind of minimize um, uh, group dynamics. So maybe um, people, are, some people are more dominant, some people are more shy to share opinions. There can be kind of aspects of groupthink when people get together and kind of um, uh, converge. Um, and so the uh, one of the key um, uh, aims of the Delphi is to maintain this anonymity. Um, the picture here, by the way, is the uh, the um, the Temple of Apollo in uh, Greece, where the Oracle of Delphi sat. Uh, I don't know my classics uh, so well. But um, uh, she was a high priestess who um, was known for her insight um, and um, uh, wisdom, and um, and especially for making good predictions about uh, what would happen in the future. And so the Delphi method it kind of emerged in the middle uh, 20th century, especially as a forecasting tool, um, uh, um, in, including for the military, and then in kind of the um, the last uh, 30 years of the 20th century or so was increasingly taken up as a as a tool for uh, creating uh, policy options and so and especially in the biomedical domain um, for the creation of guidelines and so on. So Delphi is a structured and iterative research technique to gather and distill um, expert opinions and insights on a particular topic or problem. And just to run through. Um, I'm sure you can go back and watch uh, Kelly Covey's webinar, and these issues would be would uh, be dealt with in greater depth. But the idea is that it can be used for either forecasting, for predicting, the, get, gathering expert opinions to predict what might happen in the future, or to converge um, on um, options for how to. Uh, how to act in the future. So decision support aids, um, especially like guideline development and so. Expert consensus, um, the idea is to convene those who have specialist knowledge in a certain area and bring them together to find um, a common ground of uh, what they think uh, should happen uh, or could happen. But it should encompass um, heterogeneous heterogeneous um, views. So look, diversity of stakeholders and uh, viewpoints, perspectives is important. As I said, anonymity is key. It's an iterative process. So there are multiple rounds of, of uh, survey and um, synthesis of those um, results. It's structured questioning. So the, the uh, respondents are presented with particular options or suggestions and asked um, to vote on um, whether they think this is sensible or not, um, typically. Um, and the idea here is um, to also uh, reduce a bias. So by finding consensus, maybe it um, removes um, outliers or, or minimizes the effect of, of, of those with outlying opinions and individual biases. And there's a very central role of the facilitator. The facilitator is the one really who has the overview of the whole process. Nobody else, um, the, everybody else kind of sees what they, uh, uh, they get what they're given in terms of they put their results in, they get a, a, a synthesized list of uh, recommendations or suggestions back and they're asked to vote. And this goes on in multiple rounds, but there's this kind of central role of the uh, facilitator um, and the the, part, the stakeholders themselves don't actually interact. So 
as I said, uh, On Merit was a, it was a project funded by the Science With and For Society program of the European Commission Horizon 2020. And this is heavily influenced by the ethos of responsible research and innovation that make um, research um, uh, relevant to societal needs. And this really heavily means taking into a, a account the views, the perspectives, the opinions of those wild, wider societal stakeholders. So um, these co-creative methods are more open and participatory in line with the ethos of open science and RRI. And they're relevant for uh, stakeholder engagement, also um, agenda setting, um, especially where uh, research agendas produce results which um, directly affect um, those within, beyond uh, the wider research community. Um, there's uh, user-led, uh, they're useful for user-led innovation um, and here for po policy deliberation, which is um, how, why we use it. There's a centrality of collaboration and deliberative dialogue. And here, and this is where the key difference to the Delphi is, because Delphi itself is a co-creative method, if you, if you like, with the stakeholders, you are co-creating this set of recommendations. It's just a, a very kind of fractured process of, um, uh, where there isn't this possibility of dialogue except through these very structured processes. And because of the nature of the issues, uh, we wanted um, our consideration of the recommendations that we would produce really to be deliberative and to work through these issues in a discursive way as well, which is why we wanted to introduce the co-creation. Again, diversity of perspectives um, are valued here. It's a stakeholder-centered process. So it, the idea is to prioritize the needs and preferences of those affected by the issues, especially um, end users. And they are very iterative and adaptive. The idea is to continuously improve the processes um, and react and adapt um, where possible. And uh, yeah, so with that, I will stop sharing and hand over to Nikki who will lead us through our um, process for creating the recommendations. Thanks, Tony, uh, for this background on our project and our process. Um, I am sharing my screen now. And hopefully you still see a full screen presentation. Um, get that out of the way. Okay. So as Tony said, um, we sort of merged co-creative practices, interactional co-creative practices with a traditional Delphi structure. Um, and we followed an iterative procedure as you would with a standard Delphi. Um, and so this figure represents um, the, the process and the, the iterative nature of it. Um, we actually began not with presenting recommendations, but with gathering recommendations. Um, and, and we went through three rounds of iterations um, where we first gathered recommendations, fostered discussion and debate around them, went through internal synthesis and revisions, and then presented a new set of recommendations uh, to go through this process once again. Um, and we did this process with a diverse set of stakeholders, which constituted funders, um, institutional leaders, which were kind of represented uh, mostly by research managers within higher educational institutions, um, and also with researchers themselves. And due to the focus of our project, which was primarily on practices within Europe, uh, we engaged primarily European stakeholders, but we were interested because of how we understand the unequal dynamics of how open science practices are implemented around the world. We wanted to incorporate voices from outside the European Union um, in these debates. So we also had some participants from Africa and Latin America and also from the United States. Um, so we did have diversity to some degree in geography and our participants were also um, gender diverse. Um, so we went through three rounds of this iterative process across eight total phases. And what I'm gonna do now is walk you through um, these phases in greater detail. Um, so uh, 
In round one, our first phase was to conduct a more traditional Delphi approach, which was um, three anonymous surveys, one per stakeholder group. So we were able to see um, which recommendations came from which group of stakeholders. Um, so we gathered them in response to four pre-identified problem areas that came out of the on-merit findings. Um, these were the uh, unequal nature of open access publishing, um, the reward and recognition structure, societal inclusion, uh, and the fourth one, Tony, I'm blanking on it. The, the, the resource intensity, so just generally- Resource intensity, how, of course. Like the fact that it costs, costs quite a lot to do a lot of these practices. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we we created a, a survey that had a, a kind of brief description of each of these issues and asked our participants to offer their recommendations for how you would address that. Um, and as a result of this process, we ended up with a total of 245 recommendations, uh, many of which were duplicates, um, many of which were the same recommendation just articulated to a different audience, like saying the same thing to a funder or a policymaker. Um, so we ended up with a big batch and we already had to do a bit of synthesis to be able to present these in phase two, which were three online three hour workshops, one with each stakeholder group. And so here's where we took, you know, the traditional Delphi and merged it with an interactional co-creative process. And in these workshops, we presented the existing recommendations that we've gathered so far around each specific topic. And we fostered discussion and debate uh, amongst our participants. Our kind of, our main strategy for doing so was, was to simply ask them which recommendations on a given slide around a topic made a strong impression on them, either positively or negatively. Um, and that worked well to really get conversations going um, and tease out the nuances uh, and the different perspectives or slight differences in perspectives amongst the stakeholders. And of course, they had the option to offer additional recommendations throughout this process. And doing this resulted ultimately in 93 recommendations that had been synthesized and deduplicated throughout the process. Um, and in phase three of this first round, we then compiled all of the feedback we received through this workshop process. So we had transcribed our workshops. We had taken uh, internal notes like field notes as you would as a qualitative researcher. And we also saved meeting chats, which were pretty active in, in, these, in these workshops. And we took all of this data and compiled it uh, in an Excel spreadsheet across each recommendation. So for every unique recommendation we had, we had the synthesized feedback from every single workshop from all of these different types of data. And this really gave us a global overview of the way the discussions were happening around each particular recommendation. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, through this process, we were able to make revisions based on this feedback to further synthesize and deduplicate um, to sort of pair together recommendations that were maybe speaking differently to the same issue or had similar intended meaning. And in the end of this, at this round, we had 33 unique recommendations. Um, so that's what we had going into the second round um, of this iterative process. So the second round began again with a survey, um, but instead of three, we had one single survey for all of our participants across the three stakeholder groups. They all participated in the same survey. And the aim of this survey was to establish consensus um, and to identify any further points of debate um, or issues for revision in the 33 recommendations that we had come to after round one. And so in order to establish consensus, we had a quantitative aspect of the survey where we asked our participants to respond to each recommendation, whether they fully agreed with it as written, whether they agreed with it but had minor revisions to suggest, uh, whether they had major revisions to suggest, or whether they didn't agree with the recommendation at all. And so using this quantitative data, we were able to create a consensus scale, which recommendations were at consensus versus further away. 
Um, and we also gathered qualitative data because if they wanted to suggest a revision, they had to enter that text in the survey. So we had additional feedback um, and suggestions for revisions from our participants. So we took all of this um, quant and qual data into account. We did some further internal revisions. We established that already 21 out of 33 recommendations were at consensus, um, that four were nearly there, uh, six were further from, and two were very far from it. And so um, based on that, we were able to determine that a couple should be struck, and we were able to revise and prepare for the next interactive co-creative round, which was uh, phase six, a final two-hour co-creation workshop to which all participants were invited. Um, so this was the first workshop in which researchers, research managers, and funders would interact with each other to debate and discuss final revisions um, or next round revisions on these recommendations. And so we had 12 that we were able to focus on in this, in this workshop. And the end result was we reached consensus on 31 recommendations and we agreed to strike two that were deemed irrelevant or um, insufficient. Um, so there was one final aspect, um, and this was sort of just tightening up uh, the, 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 the recommendations. So um, after taking the feedback for final revisions from this final workshop, we did some internal revisions ourselves and sort of spontaneously, because we wanted to continue involving the participants in this process, we decided to use a Google Doc um, in order to make our revisions and to let the full um, network of participants continue to work on them with us. So we offered them the option to collaborate on this Google Doc. And so um, a few did, most did not, um, but some did continue to offer some you know, minor revisions on how to finalize the recommendations. And we went through two phases of this with them. Um, before ending up at the final set of 30 co-created recommendations, which everyone felt really good about. Um, so that was our full process. And now I'm going to talk about some issues that we were able to identify in our process. Um, we were asked to reflect on sort of benefits and maybe drawbacks of this process or what we've learned through doing it. Um, so that's what we're going to do now before your questions and discussion. Um, oh, sorry. The end result, of course, the final product was um, the policy brief, which Tony mentioned earlier, um, which you can download at this link, um, as, as many have already, we're happy to say. Um, so one major issue that arose through this process, which any of you who have done sort of phased qualitative research probably know, is that there's attrition in terms of who participates. Um, so this figure, this graph shows you who, how many number, the number of people that participated across each phase. So already you can see that um, phase two, which was the first series of workshops, that was the maximum number of participants. Um, the, those people who could attend the workshop um, were only those who were also invited to do a survey. Um, but you can see that only about two thirds of the people that participated actually participated in the initial survey. So even to begin with, we did not have full group participation in generating the initial set of recommendations that we worked with. Um, that said, they all had the chance to offer a, their, their input in the workshops. Um, so we went from about two thirds to the full group. Um, however, by the time we got to phase four, which was the second survey where we established consensus, we had only about half participation. So we saw a big drop off at that point. Um, that means that the process of reaching consensus was not reached with the full group of people. Um, we did have consistent participation across the different stakeholder groups throughout the process. So we were confident that we had some representation from each group, um, but you know, disappointed that there was not broader engagement amongst all of the participants. And you can see as the process went on that it continued to drop off. And you know, something we're aware of is that this final couple of phases of revision using the Google Doc collaborative tool was really with just a very small committed set of participants. 
Um, and that, you know, very possibly affected the outcome it, that perhaps um, if everyone had participated through the full process, we would have seen slightly different outcomes in terms of the recommendations. We can't know this, of course, um, but it's possible. Um, some other issues that we can observe um, or reflect on are, are the potential impacts of mixed anonymity. So some aspects of this process were anonymous, while some were in person, so to say, online, but face to face, everybody knows who everybody is. Um, and, you know, I think a pro of that is that our participants were directly debating and there were at times, you know, heated debates um, or very, you know, nuanced discussions that would not have taken place necessarily if all of this had been done asynchronously through surveys. Um, and our participants therefore had a very large hand in shaping the outcomes. We synthesized what they did, but um, it was really them who drew, drew, drove the creation process uh, rather than us having more power in that equation. Um, but uh, on the same token, a, a con of this is that there was likely some power dynamics playing out within the discussions, right? Which happens with all groups to some degree um, that some are more outspoken, some are more quiet, um, some might be perceived as having more expertise than others, and therefore that can shape how the conversation goes. Um, we also want to point out that there may be pros and cons of having done it online versus in person. Um, on the one hand, doing it online was very cost effective. We didn't have to have a big project budget, and I think we probably got more participation than we would have if we tried to do it in person um, because it takes a lot more time to travel to a place. Um, but perhaps if we'd met in person, there could have been even more dynamic discussion um, and creativity from being together in a room um, and being sort of more engaged in the interaction itself. Whereas we all know it's easy to tune out a bit when you're in a long online workshop. Um, we've all been there, I'm sure. Um, another issue is how to how to assign credit for co-creative activities. Um, we decided to, to ask our participants. Well, let me correct that. One of our participants asked how we would do it in one of the early workshops. And then we had to reflect on that. Um, and we decided to just give the question back to them. Well, how would you like to be credited? So we asked them um, what they would like. Would you like authorship? Would you like to be acknowledged? Um, would you just like to have your name in a list as a member of the co-creation process? And in, in, in the end, they went with having a list, which is an appendix to the article, as well as um, our policy brief that lists everyone that participated. Um, although a couple did prefer to remain anonymous. So I think we have maybe a couple, 27 out of 29 were listed. Um, but maybe some were unhappy with that and didn't speak up about it. We can't be sure. Um, we have heard from some others in other settings recently doing co-creation that, you know, they're not able to participate if they're not monetarily compensated um, for their time and contribution. We've heard feedback from others that they feel a little bit like we're just taking their ideas and we're getting the credit for it, which is not something we want to be doing. Um, so there are tricky dynamics around this. And, you know, the way we went with it was simply acknowledging everybody, but there may be other ways to go about it. And the final issue I want to flag is co-creation fatigue, which perhaps has something to do with the rate of attrition we saw across our process. Um, but, you know, I think COVID fueled this to a certain extent by shifting everything online. It's, e it's easier in a way to get everybody to invite people to participate in things. People are getting more and more invitations to participate in things. And particularly with this type of research that we did focused on open science and RRI within the context of the Science Within Four Society uh, funding stream within Horizon 2020, um, you know, a lot of people from the same stakeholder groups are getting asked to participate in co-creation processes for a variety of projects on similar topics. Um, sort of overfishing a small pond, uh, so to say. And so that creates challenges. Um, you know, there people get tired of being asked all the time. Um, we are trying in a different technique in our current project um, tier two, where we're looking to collaborate with some sister projects that are a part of the same funding stream within Horizon Europe, 
and recognizing that for all of us to succeed, drawing on some of the same stakeholder resources, we're going to have to collaborate and, and you know share our own internal resources and share some of our processes so that we can all access the same groups that we want to access together and not entirely tire them out and have one project be able to gain from their knowledge while another doesn't. Um, so we're collaborating in that way in a new uh, current projects. And um, so far, that seems to be going well. Um, so this is where we end. Um, we're very grateful for your attendance and to Tracy for the invitation and very happy to receive any questions you might have um, about the method or any feedback you'd like to offer. Thank you.